Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Science Faction. The only show where a scientist, a comedian, and a comedian scientist come together to discuss science. Comedically. Hello, and welcome to Science Faction 380. Science Faction, I call BS! You brought me in just to beat the shit out of Dr. Troy. Don't you think he has better things to do on a Saturday than to lose this game to me? I mean, that would be a first time of not only Dr. Troy losing, but anybody losing to you. So that would be somewhat interesting if it happened today. I do have a hot date tonight I should be preparing for. Yes. uh, A sexy lady called the Internet. (laughs) (laughs) She looks like every woman. You will, I'm sorry, but you're probably going to wander into that date, uh, both crestfallen, and she, and because you're dating the internet, the internet will have already heard that you got your ass kicked by me, so you're probably not getting any tonight. <laughs> oh, I just uh, watch physics videos, so it's fine. I'm oh, not okay. trying to get any. Although, maybe uh, later in the night. Yeah. We'll, we'll, see, we'll see where my browsing goes. <laughs> I treat myself to pornography at the end of the night. <laughs> and speaking of somebody who treats himself to pornography at all times of the day, I, of course, am your host, comedian archaeologist, Robert Timothy, and with me, as always, is my comedian, Mr. Damien Mercado. Damien, how you doing this afternoon? I'm doing great. Yeah, that's one thing the fans don't know about Bobby. Just like that uh, Marine from the show Barry, season one. Yes. Bobby just casually watches pornography just in day the background. In, not day even out. It's not, it doesn't even arouse him anymore. It's no. more of an addiction. Yeah, it's really just to piss off the other parents of toddlers <laughs> that come to my house. I like to have it on in the background while I'm doing lab work. <laughs> <laughs> Most real scientists do. It's awesome. Oh, yeah, and it's different for different things. You know, like well, you're doing physics. Obviously, that's a squirter video. Like it just, it, you know, <laughs> chemistry, you're going for some male, male, female. Like it just depends what you're doing and what you want on in the background. That's what they don't teach you about college when you go to, yeah. when you would like in high school when they go, hey, join the STEM field. Uh-huh. You get to watch pornography all the fucking time. All day. And someone else who is quite certainly within the STEM field himself is none other than our science guest host for the afternoon, Dr. Troy Sandberg. Dr. Troy, how you doing? Doing good. I got uh, a plug in that I'm, I'm now using Twitter. So get at me if you want to learn science stuff. <laughs> I'm Dr. Troy Science, D-R-T-R-O-Y Science. And in fact, since I started this last Uh month, a couple people have reached out to me on Twitter who have known me through the show. And so one dude, uh, Talking Carpet Unit, shout out to you uh, from South America and Andy Cowie as well. Yeah, Andy Cowie has been tweeting us for a while. Like he's been a longtime fan. And I feel like we're now his ex. You're the new. You're the new scientist he's dating. <laughs> he's the flashy new kid. I, I do have to say. I mean, I like offensive humor. Uh-huh. I like this format. But I've realized, you know, I should. I need to get my own thing going. That's sure. just science because uh, it's. Some people, like my mom, uh, are not a fan of the Which is weird, because you've actually told me before that your mom is an archaeologist. She is, yeah. One would think she'd be like, oh my god, you're on a a show with an archaeologist slash science enthusiast. I love this, regardless of the amount of dick jokes. Women don't seem to appreciate the crude dick jokes quite as much as men. Maybe you should be on it with literally any other archaeologist. (laughs) I, I thought they all liked dick jokes. <laughs> we do! That's the thing! That's the type of pornography archaeologists watch! <laughs> you try and find me an art crew that can piss clean on a piss test and isn't constantly watching porn. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's get right on to I Call BS, the game where I read four science news articles, some of which are real and some of which are BS, standing for bad science. Are you guys ready to play? Yes. And to address Dr. Troy's concern, uh, I'd like to announce, I think, the time I should tell him, Dr. Troy. Dr. Troy are coming out with a clean science podcast. It's called Two Dicks Talk Science. (laughs) Um, It's it's, it's hosted by two guys named Richard. I don't want you to get the bad idea. (laughs) That'll work. (laughs) All right, let's move right on to I Call BS. I Call. I Call. I Call. I Call. I Call. Ring, ring. I Call BS. All right, I Call BS. Article number one. Researchers were able to pull genetic information out of a 1.9 million year old Gigantopithecus subtropical fossil and use it to determine that its closest living relative, the orangutan, had separated from it around 12 million years ago. Damien, is this science or bad science? Gigantopithecus. That is a hominid that walked upright but was fucking giant, right? We actually think now it probably didn't walk fully upright, but if you look, that is what a lot of people think like Sasquatch was. It's basically, it's like a nine foot tall, 1200 pound ape that may or may not have been upright. All we have is jaws and teeth right now, so we don't know that much. But eight foot, like that, that 900 pounds, like you're average- No, like 1200 pounds. Uh, your average nine foot tall human being, yes. so, so given them the foot, yeah. like Shaq. Weighs yes. like uh, like like five hundred pounds. Oh, so. th- but think of like a gorilla, right? Gorillas are only like four and a half feet tall, and they're like four hundred pounds. Yes. All right, so I'm gonna have to go with bad science. Uh-huh. I don't think that Gigantopithecus separated from the orangutan. Uh-huh. 
I think they spread for man, and those jeans are still available today. Look at the aforementioned Shaquille O'Neal and tell me that that guy... He's not a Giganto, right? But he, I mean, the, Giganto was in China, but yeah, fine, fair enough. But you say Giganto, like like that sounds like a, like a circus attraction. Come see Giganto! <laughs> and in China, the man who's six feet tall. <laughs> All right, and Dr. Troy. You know, I mean, we could do selective breeding to get Giganto humans. Mm-hmm. I believe like Yao Ming himself he is, was a ironically, product, the Chinese, yeah. a product of yeah, Chinese selective Eugenics, breeding. Yeah. And I've heard some statistic, like if you're seven feet tall or above in the U.S., 20% of seven foot tall people are in the NBA. Yes. Like, <laughs> and I we, think, I forget, I forget if seven foot is near the thing. I think there's zero percent of them that live over the age of 75. Every inch you are over six foot five is a predictable amount of less time you will live because your heart just can't handle it. Yeah. This is why, I mean, I'm not that tall. I'm 6'3", but it makes me a little like, oh, I'm, I'm probably going to die sooner. <laughs> That's your big criticism of the NBA. Like, Bobby's yeah. not a huge sports fan. There's sports he likes and there's sports Ooh. he's very knowledgeable about. Ooh, go but Lakers. His, <laughs> but his thing is, the NBA, you just won a genetic lottery. It's not about how athletic you are. It's not about how skilled I mean, you are. You're no, just fucking tall. There's athleticism involved. But if you're there, nine foot tall, you don't have to be athletic. There's basically a minimum height, right? Like, so if you look on the football field, you have everybody. You literally, you'll have Darren Sproles motherfuckers who are like four foot 11 and 175 pounds. And they can be superstars. And then you have, you know, giant offensive linemen who are freaks of nature and six foot eight and... 350 pounds, there is no place for the short man in basketball. The, I mean, there's the occasional Muggsy Bogues. What, and why is that guy so famous? Why is... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I, I like that, you know, you can be, like, the guys my height on the mm-hmm. court look like midgets, even yes. though I'm tall compared yes. to other people. Yeah, and Steve Nash running around looks exactly. tiny, yeah. So, uh, I, I like basketball. Uh, uh, I mean, I'm a, a born and raised in LA. I like Lakers. Okay, so Gigantopithecus. Gi- what, how do you Pithicus. say it? Gigantopithecus. I did see something in the news about this. I know you like to play with variables. Mm-hmm. So you said 12 million years. Mm-hmm. You said orangutans, orangutans being their closest relatives. Mm-hmm. I don't know anything about that. So I'm going to ask some probing questions okay. because these are fun when sure. I can actually, you know, work my way through it yep. and not just have to guess. So, all right. So what I'm getting hung up on is the pull genetic information out of a 1.9 million year old fossil. Uh-huh. Like DNA is difficult to preserve. Mm-hmm. But you just said genetic information. You didn't say a whole genome sequence. So can you clarify mm-hmm. wh- how much genetic information did they pull out? A couple handfuls. Was this a frozen fossil too? Like all of these no, factors? No, subtropical. Okay. Um, what I would say is you are probably not asking the right question. There. Okay. Well, then I if- hate, <laughs> hate everything about this. <laughs> If, if you, you keep your favoritism in your fucking pants. <laughs> Damien, I'm on your side. Yes. You should get the questions he's, beforehand. And, to... he's a, and he is asking questions that you can use <laughs> to determine how you're going to answer the next question. Poor Damien has to make jokes, though, instead of science. And then, you know, four He doesn't do helps. either. Uh, <laughs> oh, I like your jokes, Damien. <laughs> that's one. That's one. <laughs> yeah, well, me and Dr. Troy's mom are on the same page. <laughs> <laughs> well, she's a, cla- she's a classicist. Oh, you know, yeah, she yeah, did, she got right. her PhD in classics. That's right. All right. So if I'm not asking the right questions, then this is some archaeology thing. No, um, no, no, no. Not the right stop. Well, I, you, this is hot and cold. You are Your one question about the genome would not be the, uh, I would say it not be phrased in the right way. Okay, then I'm going to kind of have to guess. So I, I think it's reasonable. You could pull out some DNA, some DNA, not a lot, from a 1.9 million year old fossil. I might be wrong on that. Mm-hmm. It might be too old. It might have totally decayed. But I think there are ways to preserve that and get signals. I don't know about if they're related to orangutans or if it was... You know, when they branched, if it was 12 million years, if you're changing it by it was 1 million years. Um, but I know Gigantopithecus is a real thing. I'm, so I kind of just have to guess. So I'm going to go bad science. Okay. Article number two. New research has discovered that a single horizontal gene transfer allowed aquatic plants to gain the ability to grow on land from soil bacteria. Damien, is this science or bad science? That's, uh, that's a good one. Um, I'd like to ask some probing questions. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> have you ever... Had a homosexual thought about a man. Yes. <laughs> okay, that's all I needed to know. Uh-huh. Which, which man? <laughs> Anybody Kevin in this room? Bacon. <laughs> Jake Gyllenhaal. Yeah. We both know it was Dr. Troy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Ryan Reynolds. Come on, let's be honest. <laughs> I'm a human. <laughs> Dr. Troy's the poor man from Ryan Reynolds. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You don't have Ryan Reynolds in this room. You've got Dr. Troy right here. <laughs> uh, this is science, but I'm really just interested to see you hitting on Dr. Troy now. now that okay. We're talking about <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> if he wants to put on a Ryan Reynolds mask, we'll talk. <laughs> you mean a Deadpool mask? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, actually, no, because a Ryan Reynolds mask actually covers your abs. Like, that's the only way, <laughs> that's the only way to get it. Get that V. All right. And Dr. Troy. 
So one, uh, let's talk after the show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Talking uh, shit on Dr. Choice V? <laughs> Check out these abs. <laughs> um, and two, this I can reason my way through much more. Mm. So, uh, you know, there were certainly soil bacteria and fungi that were dominant on land uh, well before plants escaped from the oceans and started to be on the land. And horizontal gene transfer events, even a single gene can cause crazy innovations. I mean, you've discussed about placentas and mammals Mm -hmm. being due to viral horizontal Mm -hmm. gene transfer. So this sounds reasonable to me. I haven't seen any article about this. You could be mixing up. It's not from soil bacteria. It's from some fungus instead, but I'm going to go with science. All right. Article number three. A newly developed single-shot treatment appears to eradicate severe peanut allergies for up to six weeks. Damien, is this science or bad science? This is science and incredible news for a guy who continually sends his dog into anaphylactic shock. (laughs) (laughs) That will be helpful. By the way, why did you get that allergic to peanut butter dog? It seems counterproductive. I think he developed the allergy as a defense mechanism. (laughs) It's a PTSD allergy. (laughs) I mean, he just fakes the anaphylaxis. I'm an EpiPen. You're not faking you out of this one, dog. That was an interesting way to go. I thought you were going to be more like, yeah, it was a shot. It was just a bully punching a guy in the face and telling him to eat some peanut butter. Uh, All right, and Dr. Troy. So obviously I'm laughing at these jokes. Not for any illicit reasons. No, no, no. Your dog likes peanut butter, yeah. but he's allergic. And your mom's upset that you're laughing. <laughs> yes, yeah. Uh, mom, uh, please, don't listen. <laughs> um, okay, so this sounds possible. I'm not super familiar with the mechanisms of, you know, your peanut allergies. I know that exposure as a kid mm-hmm. very much, and even through pregnancy, the mother. Yes. Um, like if you shield yourself from peanuts. Yes. You, horribly predispose your kids to having these allergies. And we've talked about this. This is where this peanut, peanut allergies have been a 40 fold increase, not two times increase, not three, 40 fold increase. It's it's terrible. And it's the same reason people shouldn't Purell their kids all the time. Well, it is. Yeah. But it was, it was considered good sound medical advice because what ended up happening is early in the 1980s, there were a couple instances of fetuses basically going into anaphylactic shock. They're incredibly rare, you know, one in a 1.5 million chance. But Doctors were like, better safe than sorry. Pregnant women, stop eating peanut butter. So then in utero, basically an entire country's fetuses stop getting exposed to these things. And then we have this huge 40-fold increase in it. So exactly like you're saying, we created the peanut allergy problem with avoidance. So what we're saying is now, since so many doctors advocate that pregnant women don't eat sushi, we're creating an allergy to Asian culture. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) They still like the hentai, though. Uh, (laughs) Women love hentai. In fact, here's my dating advice to any science nerds out there right now. Let's just say by some miracle you score a date, spend the entire time talking about hentai. Watch the pussy just roll it. It's also Order octopus. (laughs) It is also, by the way, the porn that you put on while you're doing field sciences. (laughs) I think I've heard a good term that immune systems are anti-fragile. It's Mm. not the kind of thing like you drop them and they break. Really, you need to expose them. I think this might have been through Peter Hotez, who's a scientist, maybe someone else. It's a muscle. Um, you you flex yeah, it. And you... you need to expose. This is why you should get exposed to germs. This is why I regularly lick floors and bathrooms to <laughs> beef my immune system up <laughs> and eat out of trash cans. So I'm not super familiar with all the mechanisms, like if a shot could give you an immuno boost that only lasted for a few weeks, but that seems plausible. So I'm going to say science. All right. So if you're planning on getting a dog, make sure you know the breeder, you know the, you know the lineage. Make sure that when your puppy is in you door, you're feeding that mother dog tons of peanut butter. <laughs> you, it. Y- True. You, yeah. you don't want to be in my situation. I've lost a ton in vet bills. <laughs> for someone who wants a dog to be able to eat peanut butter for no <laughs> sexual purposes, this is uh, smart. <laughs> Can we breed a cat to do this? <laughs> All right, article number four. A new paper suggests that mammalian insulin activity inhibits a mosquito's ability to fight West Nile virus, making the virus much more prevalent in mosquitoes exposed to mammalian mammalian insulin. Damien, is this science or bad science? Now, mammalian insulin. Now, is West Nile prominent in the South? Let me ask a probing question. Mm. In the American South? No. It is not? No, I do believe we have had some some instances of it out there, but still mainly not a lot in the U.S. Okay. Now, there's very high instances of diabetes in the South. True. So That's that's probably the overeating kind and not the your insulin (laughs) is messed up kind. Oh, I see. Damn it. Well, I mean... People have to take pig insulin and whatnot. I mean, okay. Like... <laughs> well, we get human insulin now from bacteria. Yeah. If you all have insulin, I'm not diabetic. Do you regularly have to swap mosquitoes off your insulin? Probably, yeah. Yeah, okay. So I'm going to say science in that case. Okay, good, good reasoning. All right, and Dr. Troy. So this is something where just the complexity and craziness of life makes it really hard to guess accurately because I think I've shared an article with you, Bobby, on how 
you know, we share these genes with tons of other species on the planet and ants uh, in particular co-opted insulin yes. uh, to be used for their eusocial purposes. Yeah. Like the, we've found that the levels of insulin determine whether something develops into a queen or a worker and it's really interesting stuff, but it's also not at all how insulin works in us. Yeah. So it's it's the same gene. Yeah, but or, it, or we co-opted it from them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It depends on where we yeah. branched. But so it's doing entirely different things. So if you're Jones in, so if you're a diabetic and you're Jones in for an in- insulin fix, could you just like grind up some ants? And I could go, go, go like an anteater into a hive, find the queen. <laughs> the protein sequence has probably diverged enough that it would not work. You know, pigs are pretty close to humans, which yeah. is why we could use pig insulin. And you gotta um, take it as suppository too. Yeah, so, okay, so I would guess that mosquitoes should be used to being exposed to mammalian insulin. And thus, if they got more susceptibility to some disease that hurt them, that there's an evolutionary selection pressure to not have human insulin harm them in that way. So I would say this is bad science. It's maybe the opposite. All right. Let's go back. Oh, Damien, did you want your bonus question that you always Shut ask for? Shut the fuck up. Do you, you know goddamn well. For, Stop tra- this is entrapment. This is entrapment. <laughs> like, if you're a cop, you have to tell me, Bobby. If you're a cop, <laughs> No, legally. but I am Catherine Zeta-Jones going underneath a laser in very tight pants. You know what? In that case, yes, I do want a bonus question. Uh, <laughs> All right, your bonus. Can, can you show me those tight pants again? <laughs> All right, let's go back and see how you guys did. Follow along at home and see how you did. And no, Damien, I will not give you your much sought after bonus question. <laughs> I beg for it every week, and you refuse me. Article number one, researchers were able to pull genetic information out of a 1.9 million year old Gigantopithecus subtropical fossil and use it to determine that its closest living relative, the orangutan, separated from it around 12 million years ago. Both of you guys thought this was bad science, and this one is science. And the really cool part is pulling out that genetic information, because Dr. Troy was talking about DNA degradation. In subtropical environments, we would expect almost complete DNA degradation in like 500,000 years. So how much did they get out? That's really interesting. None. What? (laughs) That's because pulling out doesn't work. (laughs) (laughs) This is why I was telling you, you were asking the wrong question when you You were asking about genetic information. Yes. Explain. This stems off the discovery we covered that was only published a few months ago that is going to completely upend our ability to do cladistics of of extinct species. They can now look at what was going on because the DNA is gone. Again, we've talked about this. Even if you were to keep it frozen in a lab, the half-life of DNA is less than 6 million years old. So if you had it in the best lab conditions in a lab, you could not get DNA past 6 million years. Well, once you get to absolute zero, I would would quibble on the physics of that. But I mean, generally, yeah. Or speed it up to the speed of light to where time doesn't matter you're absolutely correct <laughs> but labs are Close not at to the speed labs are not at absolute zero in the lab condition but regardless anyway so what we covered a few months ago is that what researchers did is they went fuck we can't get the dna for this we're never gonna be able to find dna for these old fossils is there something else we can find and what they realized is the proteins in the tooth enamel actually stick around and using really 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 powerful and detailed mass spectrometry we're able to pull out the protein sequences within the animal's actual tooth dentition within the enamel of it and be able to tell relatedness by comparing those sequences with the protein sequences of other living animals. Yeah, that's really cool. So you sort of get you get genetic information, but yes. it's fuzzier. Yes. Because proteins are coded for by codons. You mm-hmm. have three DNA base pairs. It's either A, C, G, or T. Right. And the combination of these three leads to one of 20 different amino acids, which come together in chains to make proteins. So if you got a direct DNA sequence you would have the quantum resolution into what the genetic information was. And this is sort of like a fuzzier version. It's right. through a, a lens. And and, but you can still do cladistic trees by comparing those sequences with other animal sequences, living or dead. And it's really, really interesting. So we always knew that Giganto's closest living relatives is orangs. We knew that just from where they live. They live in East Asia. That's the only great ape that's out there. And it's we the also ape that can dunk as well. <laughs> aside from yes. that. We, we, we learned it from morphology of the bones and stuff. We already knew that. We did not know when they separated for the exact reasons that we have no recent Giganto Gigantopithecus that we can look at to do that genetic analysis. Until now, again, we covered this. This technology did not exist five months ago. It was just invented, just created, just done as proof of concept with a nature paper. And since then, this is going to blow open this. Remember, I told you, when we covered this story, I told you, wait for what is about to come in a tidal wave of human paleontology papers. This is the first. What's really interesting is once we started getting into the hominids like Australopithecus and the other homos that are on our own lineage, we could actually find out which ones of those are on our direct lineages and which ones are cousin species. It is really cool the crazy things we can do with teeth now that we're getting this sort of really fine-grained resolution because I had a friend at Caltech, my undergrad, Taylor Martin, who was 
part of a paper in a geolab that was the first to look at the teeth in dinosaurs mm -hmm. and look at isotopic ratios and be able to deduce their body temperatures from that. Very and interesting. now we're starting to do, you know, actual protein sequences and getting a, sort of a pseudo genetic code for them. Like it's crazy the stuff we can do. And it's because enamel is so great yes. at maintaining itself and not degrading it in the survives, ways that DNA does. Yeah, it survives a really long time. And thankfully, we have some gigantoteeth. Now, again, Gigantopithecus is known only from some teeth and a jaw. So we don't have a lot of information on its actual body. We, we're, we're extrapolating everything based on other stuff we know. It's the Denisovan of apes, yeah, basically. It is, except now we have more stuff on the Denisovan. So if I were a dentist and I were trying, if I was the uh, United States Dental Association or whatever the uh -huh. organization is called, and I wanted to encourage kids to brush, that's the thing. If you want to be cloned millions of years yeah. in the future, you're you have no this. chance without <laughs> keeping that enamel intact. It's a good point. Yeah, if bacteria eat your teeth away, uh, you, you're screwed. Dude, I told you when this came out, look for what this is going to do in the human paleontology space. This is the first paper that's coming out that is already doing this, but this isn't really, this is nowhere near our lineage, so this is long after we diverged from this group. But look for the stuff that's going to come out of this, that's going to look at Australopithecus afarensis and anamensis and Homo habilis and Homo erectus and compare all these things. Well, I think myself, Dr. Troy included, and probably most of our fan base keeps up with all paleontology news. It's uh -huh. not archaeology. Sure. It's exciting. People want to read Human it. Human paleontology, not, of course. Any paleontology is better than archaeology. But <laughs> All right. On our, I'm used to uh, giving crap to archaeologists due to my upbringing from my mom. So, sure. uh, no, it's, yeah, it's boring. No, no. <laughs> I'm sorry. This is super interesting and incredibly amazing. And we're going to unlock the secrets of our own lineage. Well, of course, I, it's paleontology. It's very interesting. <laughs> I do have to admit, actually, this is pretty cool. <laughs> Article number two. New research has discovered that a single horizontal gene transfer event allowed aquatic plants to gain the ability to grow on land from soil bacteria. Both of you guys thought this one was science, and this one is Science. And it's pretty cool because there's actually been a lot of debate on how such plants move to colonize land uh, in terms of how this happened, when it happened, where it happened. And what they, these researchers did is they basically looked at a huge mass database and tried to figure out the difference between plants, land plants, and the primitive kind of aquatic plants that they came from. Land plants be walking like this, whereas sea plants... <laughs> And they basically found a segment of DNA that got put in there that allowed for land plants to exist. They then found the correlate, basically where that DNA came from, in a form of soil bacteria. And what they think is, at this point, you had plants that were aquatic. You had areas that were inland that would get flooded in with those aquatic plants would go there. When they would dry up, those aquatic plants would then be exposed to the soil bacteria that are underneath. And at some point, you had one horizontal gene transfer event that then brought in that DNA segment that allowed for plants to grow on land. What was the gene? What did it do? I mean, the difference, my guess, would be have not having seen the article. Mm -hmm. Like, water plants can just sort of float there, but land plants need to have... Uh, to be turgid and stand upright to expose themselves to sun. So yeah. was it some cell wall protein that well, let them... And, and you, know, you have to was... have a vascular structure that allows you to grow. Yeah, complete layman here. But uh, what about salt? I mean, like tons of salt in the sea. Uh -huh. Whereas if you were to yeah. salt the earth, you would completely prevent... Sure, that's a great point. Yeah, differences in ion concentrations. And yeah, by the way, one of, thing. one of the articles that I was going to put in here, but I didn't, that came out this week that I was really interested in, I think Dr. Troy would be too, because we share a common interest in, it, in what I think is one of the most interesting organisms on Earth, which is lichen. Uh, we actually just recently found out that lichen is much younger than we thought. We thought lichen colonized the land before plants did. We mm -hmm. thought it predated it based on a bunch of different things, including its ability to kind of just grow on rocks. And that shit. makes sense, because they're a lot more simple. But... We've actually just found that they're... They're, they come much, much after land plants colonize the area. And so it's it's kind of interesting that we're narrowing that down. Do lichens come after land plants? Yes. Oh, send me that article Yes, well. yeah, a very <laughs> interesting one. So lichen just hasn't been taking care of itself. We saw this organism like, man, that must be when ancient... It's only 35? I actually I actually avoided this specifically because I know Dr. Troy is also interested in lichen like I am. And I'm like, he might have read this. I'm, I'm going to, as always, I'm going to be overly fair to Damien and keep this one out. <laughs> yeah, I hadn't fair. read that. But that now thinking about it, that makes a little sense because... It's a cooperation between yes. two different species, and that takes a long time to evolve. That's why could be. the prokaryote to eukaryote transition yeah. in the evolutionary history of life on Earth took billions of years. Because yeah. it's hard to sort of specialize and cooperate and domesticate each other, as we talked about in last episode. Sure. All right, article number three. A newly developed single-shot treatment appears to eradicate severe peanut allergies for up to six weeks. Both of you guys thought this one was science, and this one is science. And they did it 
by going down a completely different allergy treatment path. So our main allergy treatment path nowadays is what I call the princess bride treatment, which is you just slowly give them little bit by little bit by little bit until you gain an immunity to what otherwise causes you allergies. And we had to kill a lot of Sicilians to make this happen. <laughs> and you never start a land war in Asia. <laughs> People should watch The Princess Bride, by yes. the way. If they're, I'm young enough to, I have seen it, actually. Yeah, it's, it's the only movie where when they announce they're making a, a like a remake, you're like, why? Like, There's nothing wrong with that movie. Yeah. Wait, it's, is Andre the Giant yeah. attached? Did they, <laughs> did they reanimate or clone Andre the Giant? Who would, yeah, who would replace him? Yao Ming, I don't know. Shaq? <laughs> Dwayne the Rock Johnson. <laughs> so this is a little bit different. This is really interesting. So imagine what an allergy is. An allergy is just your body's immune system going out of control and thinking that something that's either harmless or not a big deal is really a big deal and having an overactive reaction to it, the reaction of which kills you. So that it's not like when you get uh, some shellfish and you're allergic to it, there's nothing in that shellfish that's poisoning your body. What's happening is your immune system is overreacting to something in that shellfish, and that overreaction is what kills you. It's called anaphylaxis, right? That's what kills you. So it's it's a weird thing where it's almost – it's not really a poison. It's just a thing that tricks your stupid-ass body into killing itself. This is an example of evolution screwing us over because yes. these systems are designed to protect us, and sometimes they actually – cause active harm and the worlds we live in now where we're sheltered from germs mm -hmm. are making it even worse and worse. Yes, and we know that we get a lot of our allergen germs. Those of us who are non-Sub-Saharan Africans get a lot of our allergen germs from Neanderthals. We also get our peanut allergies from stupid moms. <laughs> Who, who, again, are just trying to protect us, but in actuality made it so I can't eat a fucking Reese's for my whole goddamn life. I saw a talk at a conference not too long ago about how uh, households with pets and dogs in particular, yes. they're great vectors for germs, and yep. they expose the kids much more, and they're less likely to have allergy problems and there things like that. There are numerous studies that show a relation to household pets and uh, better immune systems as and lower allergy rates at, at an older age. And I didn't have pets, which is why I have to eat out of the trash and <laughs> lick floors. That's right. This is actually my best argument for pig ownership. Like, I've always wanted to own, like, a pig. Like, oh, like, like something small that They're grows cute. to be yeah. like, yeah. And, like, that's probably my best, like, if you're ever, like, going to get married and have a family. Listen, this is this is for, yeah. this is an investment in our child's immune system. Get the and, fucking pig. And when they die of old age, you know, peacefully, free bacon. Yes. <laughs> but by the way, yeah, if, if you kill an old pig, like, if I if I take a pig down uh -huh. in its 90s and it has yes. pig Alzheimer's. Yes. What effect does that have on the meat? Oh, it's not going to taste. Like the Kobe beef cows and, you know, things people have researched, like you you need to optimize when it is and the muscles shouldn't have degraded from age. Gotcha. So it probably tastes like crap. Wanna, like like high school athlete equivalent. Yeah, like kind at, of. At, their most, at this pig's most fuckable, that's when you're like a high school athlete, by the way. So, <laughs> so this shot, this idea, it goes a completely different route. Instead of doing the give a little bit, little bit, little bit, they actually are targeting a single molecule called interleukin-33, which is part of the allergic response. So this shot suppresses interleukin-33. And what does that suppression do? It means that you don't end up having the allergic reaction at all because it's part of the molecular signaling system that isolates what it is you are allergic to and directs your body to have an immune response. So if you suppress this particular molecule, you basically prevent that from happening. So they had a really small end number, just 20 people, but they basically gave them this shot and then would expose them in a safe and medical environment to peanut proteins over and over again. So they had different kind of effects. They, it worked for basically everybody for a short time. 15 days later, 73% of the group was still able to eat one nut's worth of a peanut protein without any reaction whatsoever. On day 45, 57% of them were able to, and that kept on going all the way up to six weeks out. Two nuts worth is the more important metric than one nut, <laughs> unless you're Lance Armstrong. <laughs> During this time when they could have, when they weren't allergic or as mm -hmm. allergic to, could they build up an immunity to peanuts then? Oh, that's an interesting point. I don't know. I, it would be curious. Now, they lost that immunity, which is a lot, by the way. There's a lot of peanut protein in a single peanut. So, like, that is a lot. You wouldn't necessarily expect them to be that far along the line of a typical allergic treatment. But it is interesting to think that this one shot could do it because – seemingly, you could have people who just treat themselves. Uh, okay, uh, every six weeks, every five weeks, I go in and get a needle or I take a shot and all of a sudden I don't have this looming death over me. I so so in, in Parks and Rec, when they would say, treat yourself, this, yes. this is actually like a pro-allergy <laughs> uh -huh. treatment. I think you raise a great point, Damien, actually, because maybe the shot mitigates your aller allergic response to peanuts for a while and then you can 
combine it with the Princess Bride treatment, yes. and give yourself exposure, and then maybe slowly not need yes. the regular. Though I anymore. would be curious to know if that actually works because it might be that that exposure treatment is affecting the inner leukon thirty three, and if you're suppressing it, then you're not getting that. Say, I, I don't yeah. know. Yeah, there'd have to be more studies because it's too early to tell. Very, very interesting though because that is something that I mean, listen, there's some people who die from it, but there's also just a lot of people that live shitty lives having to worry about whether or not that peanut butter sandwich next to them is going to kill them on the airplane, right? Or yeah, preventing me from getting nuts on the plane. Yeah, like, yeah. Screw those people. Surprised didn't come sooner, but uh, Andre the Giant actually has a pretty fam- famous peanut line from The Princess That's Bride. That's true. Well, anybody want a peanut? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Article number four, a new paper suggests that mammalian insulin actually inhibits a mosquito's ability to fight West Nile virus, making the virus much more prevalent in mosquitoes exposed to mammalian insulin. Damien thinks this is true. Dr. Troy thinks this is false. And this one is bad science. It is the opposite. Congratulations, Dr. Troy, by the way, winning as you do every single time. See, I, I had assumed that you actually went back in time, changed the article, changed or, or, or changed <laughs> physical history. Yes. I got you to say it multiple times in different ways. <laughs> I can say I was a little nervous with my guess because uh-huh. it doesn't make evolutionary sense for the mosquitoes to have that response. Sure. But maybe humans evolved our insulin, at least in Africa, right. to like combat them. So it could have been, you know, it depends on where the evolutionary arms race has gone. Yeah. Well, in this case, it was the opposite. The mammalian insulin actually increased the mosquitoes' ability to fight off the infection in their own body, therefore significantly reducing their viral load, therefore making it less likely that they would transmit the virus to humans and they carry it. It's like eating fruits and veggies and getting your nutrients makes humans less likely to get sick. Yes. Like, this is the food for mosquitoes. Yeah, well, now, this is not going to happen just when they suck a human being's blood. What they're doing is giving them super insulin high levels of food that go in their system. When they have these, oh. they are basically able to then suppress this, the infection in their own bodies. That's really interesting because our insulin is causing an effect in that mosquito that suppresses the West Nile virus, which then keeps them from infecting us. So these were non-natural dose levels? Yes. Okay. Then I'd be very curious to know what just from natural blood drinking, what right. effect it has. Yeah. So mosquitoes actively are infected by West Nile. I thought they were just a vector that carried it. To t- like they, I thought they're just like uh, just like toxoplasmosis. Uh-huh. The the West Nile virus is just trying to get to the sexy cat stomach that is our body. <laughs> so that's how malaria works. But I, I'm sure they're prone to viruses preying on them as well. Yeah, I mean the di- the difference would be like obviously malaria protease is like you know mm-hmm. it's it's actually a living being as opposed to just a self replicating form of of genetic material like a, a West Nile virus. Well, just because I've been on the show and we've talked about science for so long, I know that a virus. Like uh, like the fact that HIV affects both humans and what gorillas or chimps, or yeah. chimps. like that's huge. On but but, but West Nile affects both mosquitoes and humans. Yeah. Wow. That, yeah. yeah, that is interesting. How yeah, how different are like the same virus itself or slightly different subspecies? Well, yeah, like, and I think I mean I, I I'm gonna go ahead and take a wild guess and say that some of it is too the suppression of the West Nile in their own body. Like it, so, when they're if they pull up blood with West Nile in it and they're running around there's probably some suppression that is going on with whatever is in their system as well. Yeah, I guess the West Nile, because they're taking human cells into themselves, yeah. maybe the West Nile could target the human cells and then just sneak into the insect cells mm-hmm. and, and mess them up. That's interesting to think about. It is really interesting. And what what is more interesting is like, do you just leave big vats of like insulin lying around? <laughs> just uh, come on, mosquitoes, <laughs> drink it up. Yeah, maybe fill, you know, mosquitoes breed in the pools of still water. Yeah. Like, just spray a bunch of insulin in from there. From now on, every time you have an old car tire, you got to fill it with insulin. Yeah, and <laughs> warn the humans, like, please don't drink from this. You're going to get <laughs> diabetic and messed up. So is this why, like, vampires, for example, in Louisiana, they might hold up to want to hold on to their humanity, but if you drink from alligators for too long, eventually you get West Nile, and you're like, right. I have to drink a human to that, cure myself. That is most likely the case. I've seen an interview with a vampire. That was the plot, right? Yeah. <laughs> all right. Thank you, audience, for coming back for Science Faction 380, where you learned all about how we pulled genetic information from a 1.9 million-year-old fossil, how horizontal gene transfer allowed aquatic plants to gain the ability to grow on land from soil bacteria, how a single-shot treatment appears to eradicate severe peanut allergies for up to six weeks, and how mammalian insulin can actually increase a mosquito's ability to fight West Nile virus. Thank you so much for joining us, and come on back next week for Science Faction 381. To appease your mom, Dr. Troy, no longer dick jokes. All pussy jokes. You've been listening to Science Faction. Wait, that's not right. Right.